we now move on to the debate sessions in uh, our uh, 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 on our uh, session here. So the first one uh, will be started by Eva, and then she will get some response by Pierre Fenot afterwards. And for the second debate, it will be the other way around. I learned because you know we have two senior experts who have their own opinion how we should approach these issues. So they have. Uh, change the order according to their own opinions. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether there is a rather pro and con of either of you in all these uh, issues. But we will hear that from you. Okay, friends. I hope that you are awake now and really will engage in this discussion. Pierre Fenot and I have agreed to disagree as much as possible. So this is our our aim. Uh, so the first question, we have two questions, and I will start, as Theo said, uh, them being responded to by Pierre and then vice versa. So the first question is whether to, what we do when we have a, what we call CCAS, I will come back to what that is, with three mutations or more. Should we go for an allotransplant or should we not? And how do we think about this? Uh, sorry, I have no disclosures, and just some few definitions because these are modern terms and we have used them for the last five years or so. We have the ship, clonal hemopoiesis of indeterminate potential. We don't talk about them in terms of transplant. They're usually small clones and they have, per definition, nothing wrong with their blood values and they're not sick in the bone marrow as for what we can see. And then we have the ICUS, idiopathic cytopenia of undetermined significance. Either we, they, they ha we have checked the NGS and they don't have mutations, or also in, in, in previous ages they may not have been checked for NGS, but we don't have any known clonal um, changes. And then we have what we were given today as subject, the CECAS, clonal cytopenia of undetermined significance. And this is actually what we are going to discuss today, because it is a problem. I'm absolutely sure that you have um, a lot of patients. So I will have two cases embedded in my talk. The, the first one is a man born in 1947. He's super healthy. He's in good physical condition. He's an international professional. He travels around the world. He's well read. So he really knows what he wants. And in September 2016, he's referred because of a fairly distinct cytopenia, hemoglobin of 101, elevated MCV, slightly low white blood cell count uh, with slightly low ANC, and normal platelets. And we take him in for a bone marrow. He has a normal cellularity or perhaps slightly elevated for the age. 1% myeloblast, no dysplasia. I can tell you at the Karolinska, we have very MDS-prone pathology, so they will not miss dysplasia if they are there. He has a normal karyotype, and he has a TLGL clone of around 20%. So the first thing we think then is that he has a suspected LGL-associated cytopenia, and we start him on cyclosporin A. And then two months pass, and at that time he has actually decreased his hemoglobin levels to 93, which is then starts to become a bit symptomatic, further decreased the, the, uh, the, the white blood cell count, sorry for the Swedish abbreviation, and further decreased the ANC, uh, same platelet count. And then, uh, at that time, we are not so rapid with our NGS, but then we have the true side panel, 50 genes, that comes in November. And he has actually five pathogenic mutations. The VEFs are not super big. I mean, the, the ZRSR2 is, is X-linked, so you should sort of half that is 19% to 20% approximately. So he has five pathogenic mutations, of which the bigger clones, the tattoos, are around... 22%, about 40 plus percent of the bone marrow cells, and the other ones are smaller, indicating that it has also been some kind of clonal evolution. So we have to define him as a CCAS with five pathogenic mutations and a suspected LGL clone. So we skip the LGL clone. And what, how to advise this guy? So, what can we learn then from the literature? Uh, we, lo we knew about this data before it was published. This is the big study by, by Luca Malkavat and Marika Zola published in Blood in June. 
and they had a learning cohort of 683 consecutive patients in, investigated for unexplained cytopenia. And they had a validation cohort in, in addition to this that did an NGS sequencing for 40 genes and 64% of these patients had one mutation or more. And they showed that carrying one or more somatic mutation was associated with a high probability of developing a myeloid neoplasm with a very high hazard ratio. So this is, uh, uh, and then they looked at what is the risk of actually developing a myeloid neoplasm, most often than an MDS. So uh, if you have a significant cytopenia, even if you don't have a mutation, you still have a risk of, of developing MDS or, or something else. Any mutation, a very high risk. And if you have the specific mutations, I cannot go into the details, but they are in particular the splice factor genes and so forth. You have a very high risk of developing MDS within a short period of time, within a couple of years. And if you look at the number of mutations, if you have no mutation, the risk of developing MDS is, is fairly low, but if you have four mutations, it's very high, and our patient had five mutations, which is not even in, in this paper. Uh, there is another study still not published by the Danish group, Jörg Werner Hansen, one of the organizers here at this meeting, and he compared survival curves of ICUS seekers and then MDS patients uh, from the Karolinska cohort, lower risk MDS, but without then a sideroblast to, to avoid this more obvious low risk. And as you can see, there are no major differences between the survival between these groups of patients. But on the other hand, if you take the 50% line and drag that out, the MDS patients will end up here around four to five years, and the CECUS patients around seven to six years. And then, I mean, you have to ask yourself, what would you like to have yourself. If you are 50 years old, 60 years old, 80 years old, and so forth, what expected survival are you actually looking for? Then going to what we then have defined as proper MDS, and this is from Eli Papa Manuel's early data in 2013, having three mutations, this is the purple line in the middle, actually gives you a median survival of 30 months. So our guy didn't really have an MDS diagnosis, but of course he had an MDS of some sort with five mutations. So having three mutations or five mutations as he had, that really gives you a very poor predicted survival. So how do we advise this guy? Four pathogenic mutations, high, which is highly predictive for myeloid neoplasm. He had actually five pathogenic mutations, including then the ZRSR2, which is in addition to that highly predictive because of being a splice factor mutation. And he had an AXXL1 mutation, which is not that good. So this guy was deemed having a high risk for progression to myeloid neoplasm and then having a poor prognosis because this is what you have if you have MDS and mutations. So we made a decision about stem cell transplantation and we did, that, we did the stem cell transplantation with a 12-12 match performed two years ago and the patient is doing well. We can discuss this case later. The, the second case is actually more difficult, and I will take you through this. This is a much younger woman, born in 1967, and we have this new joke at the transplant department, so we have comorbidity, you can have zero, one, two, and then we have the plus category, and this woman belongs to the plus category. She runs marathon, she do this you know, horrible long cross-country skiing of 80 kilometers, she bicycles, 350 kilometers, and you know this, this uh, phenotype of people. Uh, I, I don't belong to that phenotype. So we are in January 2016, and she comes in with a slightly minor hemoglobin, but not, I mean, still normal. She has a slight leukopenia, ANC count, and a normal platelet count. Bone marrow totally normal, uh, including cytogenetics. Then she comes in, 11 months later for a full workup, stable hemoglobin, the platelets have actually decreased to 100, and the ANC have also decreased to 0 0.5, 0 0.7. She has a normal blast count, 
2.5%, but they have actually increased for 1%. She has now borderline dysplasia in her megakaryocytes only, and she doesn't really get the diagnosis. But then we get the true site analysis, and she has three pathogenic mutations. Uh, two with, with uh, quite a big variant allele frequency corresponding to 70% of the cells, and one smaller TET2 clone. They're all deemed to be pathogenic. And then, I mean, we come to this. Do you call this a seekers? Or is already now the mutations influencing our pathology, so we would start to call this an MDS? That's the question. During 2017, she, she experienced a further decrease. Hemoglobin 115, the platelets are further decreasing to below 100. And now I would like to point out a very interesting paper by, by, by Raphael Istikson from the French group showing that in particular platelet decrease, if she would have had an MDS diagnosis, actually predicts for a poorer prognosis. So we think this is an ominous sign. And now at the new bone marrow, she actually has more significant dysplasias. Uh, the NGS true site, um, uh, we can see that the same mutations are there, stable variant allele frequencies, but the cellularity increases to 70%, indicating even more inefficient hemopoiesis. So now we call her an MDS. She has an IPSSR low, but she has three mutations. The patient is very, very eager to get rid of disease. She's prepared to do another marathon run just to get, she doesn't want to live with the disease. I think about David Stinsmas' talk earlier that we always treat the patient, and patients are actually very, very different from each other. And then we actually uh, evaluate the non-relapse mortality risk uh, against the very, uh, very high risk to develop more overt disease, considering her age. She's only 50 years old. There's no family history, I can tell you that from the beginning. This is done the Swedish population-based registry containing all patients with MDS because you don't escape in Sweden. Uh, and so here we have all the patients. And if you look at the curve there, she has also IPSs, or an intermediate one risk, and she actually has a predicted survival than all patients, all ages, of around two and a half years. Of course, she will have a better survival because she's young, but even if you look at the relative survival to to, to, to your right, to my right too, actually. And, and um, then you can see that if you are 50 years old and you look at the orange curve, the relative survival, is this something that you would like to face, to live with? It's up, it's up to you, it's up to each individual. So I think when we actually advise our patients, decision-making in allogeneic stem cell transplantation, we can't look at old retrospective studies and say, well, there is 30% non-relapse mortality in MDS, which we have in the older retrospective pages. We have to use a more basin approach, accounting for the actual experience at the center. And when I asked Per Jungmann uh, the other day, I said, what are the actual figures? And he gave me the figures for May 15, May 18, with at least one year of follow-up for all patients. And if you look at our adult patients, we have a non-relapse mortality for 5.4%. And if we look particularly at MDS patients, we have an 8.1% non-relapse mortality over this particular period. One died actually from prostate cancer. And even if we back up a couple of years, we are approximately in the same figures. So what we tell our patients today is that we face an approximately 10% risk of actually non-relapse mortality. Then I would like to point out that we have a prospective study in the Nordic region encompassing all 12 centers in the Nordic region, prospectively since August 2016, uh, looking at, this is an MRD study. You are welcome to look at Magnus Tobiasson's poster down at the poster hall. And we have now included 200 patients and approximately 150 where we have more than a three months follow-up. And we have already in these 12 centers non-relapse mortality of 10%. That will most likely increase due to late GVHD, but not that much. But she's still a problem <coughs> because everything was set. We gave her acetocytidine to downregulate the clone. And then in January 2018, 
19, sorry, my mistake. Uh, the donor disappears from the register, just like that. No other acceptable registered donor to find. She has an 18-year-old daughter willing to donate haplo bone marrow. And what to do? Go ahead with the haplo transplant. She has now increased to around, I would say, 20% of an M NRM prediction, or wait until MDS progression. We haven't really uh, got done with this uh, decision yet. We are thinking about, she is thinking about it. So, what about decision making in allo stem cell transplantation for MDS? And I assume that all of you agree that if this patient had high risk MDS, she would be go for a transplant. So we have two options. We can transplant her now, and we have to look at the NRM uh, at the center, I think, and we have to think about post stem cell transplantation morbidity. That is on the negative side for making a transplant now. But we also have to think on the positive side for going now, and that is that condition, the condition she has will shorten her survival, and she has not a stable disease, so platelets are decreasing. She has a personal preference to aim for cure. She doesn't, she's a career person. She doesn't want to go around having to be tested all the time, always having that in her head. But she is also able to reason around this. And then, most importantly, the nature of progression is always unknown. Uh, so it could be anything. Uh, to do the stem cell transplantation later, that may give several years without symptoms, if she sort of plans out is stable. And the active watch and wait strategy has been or can be advocated for, although it would really require a very dense follow-up of this patient. But at progression on the negative side, the leukemic stem cells may have acquired new lesions, they usually have. They may, the disease may then be incurable, and relapse rate may be increased. And then on the more psychological side, uh, life may be put on hold. And I will then advertise the same going to the booth tomorrow. And I think now it's actually Pierre, if one could get Pierre's response to this. Thank, thank you, thank you, Eva. Okay, so uh, I will broaden the spectrum of the discussion to lower risk MDS rather than CCUS. I think the, the problems are, 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 are about the same. So uh, I'd like first, what are the prognostic factors in lower risk MDS? Uh, uh, and uh, I think. Is there a pointer? Yes. Okay. So, of course, our, our, our IPSS, somatic mutations, that was the topic, specific prognostic scores, possibly flow cytometry, but also the effect of first-line treatment, which I think is crucial. And just to say, what is the impact of mutations in non-transplant treatment in low-risk MDS? Well, th th this paper from the GFM found that indeed having more than two mutations was associated with lower response to uh, ESAs. But that was not a, a, uh, an independent prognostic factor. And some patients did respond indeed, in, even though they had more than two mutations. Likewise, in patients treated with lenalidomide, I'm speaking of non del 5 q patients. del 5 q patients will be uh, uh, well, with P3 mutation, will be dealt with in the next uh, in the next debate. In those patients, DNMT3 mutation was a favourable uh, uh, factor, and the, the number of mutations uh, did was uh, did not impact response to to lenalidomide. So those patients could respond to to treatment, even second line treatment. And lastly, uh, we also use a cytidine in lower risk MDS and found that uh, the only uh, mutation associated actually with better response was SF3B1. So even patients with mutation can respond even if several mutations are seen. And what is important, I think, is the impact of response to treatment in the, in the, in, in the present case to ESAs. Uh, uh, the duration of, of the response and duration of response to ESAs is associated with progression to AML and survival. So if you respond for more than 
two years, for example, you have a better prognosis that if you don't respond or respond for a short, uh, for a short period. So, uh, and I think this is valid for a treat all treatments. It's valid also for lenalidomide in, in DEL5Q patients, in non-DEL5Q patients, in, in hypo with hypomethylating agents. So this factor, I think, has to be taken into account uh, in, in, in low-risk MDS, but I think I, I would say in every disease. The, what is now the outcome of lower risk MDS with transplant? And here I'm concerned mainly with the transplant related mortality. This is a, a, a study that included several hundreds of patients and uh, Theo is a co-author. And what I see here is that the survival in low risk MDS is something like 60% and there's an early mortality which obviously corresponds to transplant related mortality which is quite important here. I'll give the details. Uh, another study, this is the first Italian study that analyzed the effect of, of, um, uh, of IPSS on transplant. And as you can see, lower risk MDS have, well, in the longer term, have a better outcome with transplant. But you can see the early mortality here, 25 to 30 percent. And the same here with another, an update based now on the IPSSR, where you can see that the uh, even patients in low risk MDS have a survival of 70% and no relapse. So you know where the deaths come from. It comes from transplant related mortality. And that's, of course, series with several hundred patients. Now, in this series of about, by EBMT of about 1,000 patients, you can see that there are several factors uh, with an impact on survival and being greater than 50 years of age already gives you a score of two. And if you have one more point, like blood blast, platelet transplant, uh, donor type, etc., you all are already uh, 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 intermediate. And as you can see, even the low risk patient have a non relapse mortality of, well, 15%, and it goes up if you are more than 50 and just have one factor. And finally, this is a, uh, work also by EBMT, not published as yet. The, the slide was given to me by, by Marie Robin, which is really an individualized evaluation of the transplant-related mortality based on the type of donor, the, uh, the, the, the early, intermediate, or late MDS, and also the SORO score. And you cannot read, but I can tell you that, well, if you are 60, and, well, 52 is, is, is an age for MDS, but less than 10% of MDS, well, 10 to 15% of MDS are age 52 of uh, uh, age or less. So the majority is, is older. And if you take a patient age 60, a transplanted with even a sorrow score of zero, transplanted with a, an HLA sibling, the risk in this series of 1,000 patients is 24%, the TRM. And if you go now to a mud transplant, it is 32%. Of course, we know those series include patients sometimes transplanted 10 years ago. So, and we've seen in the previous presentation that there's an improvement in, in transplant-related mortality uh, with, uh, uh, in the last few years. But at least, and above all, uh, uh, of course, transplant-related mortality occurs early. Also, uh, this um, um, Japanese study shows that uh, um, the problem is, does a transplant abrogate the poor prognostic value of mutations? It's not certain. And this, in this uh, Japanese study, as you know, the risk of, of relapse increases with the number of mutations, like in non-transplanted patients, by the way. And, uh, well, I can skip this one. And this is a, a, a study by Matteo de la Porta showing that, uh, indeed, in MDS, a transplant does not abrogate the poor prognostic value of many mutations like RANX1, ASXL1, although it does so for perhaps DNMT3A, and also uh, for IDH1 or 2, EZH2. So it, it's not because uh, you have a poor prognostic patient that a, a transplant is going to improve uh, outcome, obviously. And so with this in, in mind, I would tend to say that, therefore, you have transplant-related mortality, you have the fact that transplant may not improve the outcome of those patients, and you have also the effect of uh, other treatments which have an impact on survival. So I would tend to say, uh, to conclude, that I would never transplant a patient 
with RARS, with normal carrier type and isolated SF3B1 mutation, or perhaps plus TET2 mutation. We know that if there is wrong SWAN mutation, that worsens prognosis. And of course, I would monitor this patient. On the contrary, I would probably transplant, that's the next debate, a patient with TP53 mutation that uh, I increases, and probably also lower risk MDS, uh, uh, DER5 q failing uh, lenalidomide. I, I guess uh, Eva will talk about this uh, later on. And in other patients, I would take into account, of course, age, which obviously uh, 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 increasing age uh, 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 worsens the, the risk of TRM, and uh, especially in the, uh, the first patient who was 70 or so, comorbidity, quality of donor. Response to treatment, I, I think, is crucial, not only because it has an impact on prognosis, but my impression is that patients at low risk MDS patients who are not anemic generally have a relatively good quality of life and many, in many cases don't want to take the risk of a transplant. Of course, we may have exceptions. The, the, the second patient presented by, by Eva may, may be an exception. So it's always difficult. Severity of cytopenia, it's obvious when you have severe thrombocytopenia, or if you are fed up with being transfused every two weeks. And disease progression, obviously, you have to monitor the patients. And I don't think a patient responding to any treatment will, will have AML the next day. It may occur, but it's not so frequent. And of course, the patient choice. And finally, this is, of course, discussion, but it has to be tested prospectively. And so Marie Robin for the GFM set up a, a trial for low-risk MDS where patients uh, 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 it's lower risk MDS who have I intermediate IPSS, uh, uh, revised IPSS, uh, so, I'm sorry, sorry, intermediate or higher risk revised IPSS or who have severe cytopenias. And of course, they are they're transplanted if they have a donor or, or, or not. So it's, a, as usual, this kind of genetic randomization, which hopefully will, will help us in, in, in responding to this, to this quest, difficult question. Thank you. So we defer the discussion after the second uh, pro and con debate, then we will have an overall discussion if you do agree. Of course, you are in the lead. No, uh, you decide. Yeah. I think that's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then Pierre may continue okay. um, with his uh, pre presentation, but now on the higher risk side, especially so, characterized by P53 mutations. So the idea is really here the opposite. We are dealing here with the worst type of, of uh, MDS and should they be transplanted with the idea that perhaps they are hopeless even with transplantation. So I'll try to, 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 to bring uh, my ideas here. First, there are at least two categories of, of TP53 mutation as in, in MDS and perhaps uh, even three as a, 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 Eli Papa Emmanuel did previously, we know that most of those patients have complex carrier type and uh, very often uh, 17p deletion, therefore they are, as Eli said, said uh, 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 by allelic uh, mutations, but we know also that low-risk MDS with their 5Q have about uh, TB3 mutation in 20% of the cases. The problem is that in some cases, they have very low VAF or, or can even be transient. Last week, I saw patients who had four small clones, uh, 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 TB3 mutated clones of about 1%. So the significance of this is unclear, and we need clearly follow up. And finally, when we do when we perform systematic uh, uh, NGS in, in MDS, we find that a certain number of patients have, have low, well, sap TP3 mutation with generally low VAF. And once again, the significance in those patients is probably unclear. And they probably, those two categories, have a, a better prognosis. So what is the outcome in those patients without transplant? So I guess Eva will tell us uh, uh, about us, uh, uh, about it. Uh, also, we know that they, they really don't respond well to chemotherapy, to uh, hypomethylating agents, and also when they are uh, uh, low risk to, to an, an isolated dr 5 q to lenalidomide, uh, mainly because they have less cytogenetic responses and have short responses, but once again, they may respond to lenalidomide. And this is also the case in, in AML, in our experience. So uh, TB3 mutation associated with poor response to well, poor survival with azacitidine. And uh, 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 Guillermo Garcia Manero, uh, in, in a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine, also uh, summarized the previous ex published experience, clearly showing indeed that 
Uh, most studies with HMA show uh, that uh, uh, TP3 uh, mutations associated with poorer prognosis, although it may, at least in the case of AML, is a site that it may be better than intensive chemotherapy. So what now is the outcome with transplant? So the idea with many series was that uh, it was so poor that there was, I mean, those patients were kind of hopeless and no need to transplant. And, well, this is the, 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 the larger series, I guess, presented yesterday by Ben Eber, who, who found that, indeed, uh, and as uh, Ellis uh, stressed also earlier uh, today, they, well, the, the outcome is clearly poorer in patients with TP3 mutation. But, I mean, some of them, well, have, you know, have it's about 20% here. It's always difficult to say in the long term, but at least here, those patients... 20% have a better outcome. And uh, this uh, Japanese series suggests indeed that those who have a better outcome are those without complex character. We would have to detail uh, precisely uh, whether they by allelic mutated, uh, uh, had they, uh, uh, well, uh, 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 mainly by, by loss of the second allele. And this was confirmed on an external cohort where patients with, with uh, 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 TP3 and no complex karyotype are here as compared to with those with complex karyotype. Interestingly, in, in uh, a therapy-related MDS, at least in this series, the effect of TP53 mutation, uh, uh, there was no effect uh, uh, in those in this series of TP53, uh, of uh, therapy-related uh, MDS. Now, so clearly, well, we, we clearly uh, we have a poorer uh, uh, outcome of patients with TP3 mutation. But should we say then now we don't transplant them because they are too poor? And what do we expect from the other, uh, 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 the other treatments? And my message will be that it's not either treatment or, or, uh, or transplant. It's, it's the combination of, of all possible treatments. So what is the, the outcome? Uh, how, how can we improve? And, and so we have... Uh, Possibly uh, other HMAs like the cytobine 10 day cycle. I think Eva will, will present on that. Intensive chemotherapy perhaps could be improved. Venetoclax is a question. HMA and DLI post transplant that has already been alluded to by, by a previous speaker. And finally, reconforming agents like APR 246. So I will not say anything on the cytobine 10 day, a 10 day regimen, which may improve. The, the outcome of patients as compared to, to classical regimens or azacitidine. This is disputed. Now, what about intensive chemotherapy? We know that classical intensive chemotherapy doesn't work very well in those patients. Uh, now, can uh, and, uh, liposomal chemotherapy like CPX351 do better? We know it does better than a classical 3 plus 7. Now, in this series, uh, uh, 18 patients, this was presented last year at ASH, 18 patients had TB3 mutation, and the response rate was 33%. So I don't know about response duration, but th th that response rate was pretty low. Uh, and uh, Lionel Ades for the GFM uh, used a combination of chemotherapy, classical donomycin RSC plus lenalidomide in high-risk MDS or AML with DEL5Q. Almost all of them had complex karyotype. There was no analysis of TB3 mutation, but we know that most of those patients had, have a mutation. What he found in, there was escalating doses of chemotherapy. What he found in, in 82 patients were they, well, an interesting CR rate of 46% plus uh, uh, some, uh, well, some partial responses. So an interesting response rate and also uh, uh, two-thirds of the patients achieved cytogenetic response. Unfortunately, response was short. Uh, median duration of response six months and median overall survival eight months. It perhaps could be useful to, to bridge some, some patients to transplants. Here we had a population that was not selected for transplant. Some, many were aged. Only about one-third of patients were bridged to transplant. But uh, that's, this is potentially interesting and may give uh, uh, more short-term responses than classical chemotherapy. Uh, and this is the uh, survival curve uh, uh, in that series. Now, is venetoclax uh, an interesting drug? Well, we know venetoclax seems to improve the outcome of the cytobine and azacitidine in AML. W when it comes now to, to TP53 mutated patients, the CR plus, plus CRI response rate was 47%. Uh, were lower than in other genetic subtypes. But the median duration of response was only 5.6 months and median survival uh, only 7 to 
0.2 months. So it may not give as, as breakthrough results as it, as it does in CLL with TP53 mutation. And uh, HMA and DLI post-transplant have, have been alluded to previously. They can be used, as said before, for relapse, or they can be used, as suggested by, by the German group, uh, 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 and the paper by Uwe Spratzbecker by using a, a preemptive approach when based on MRD or donor chimerism uh, in flow sorted CD34 positive cells and you start azacitidine as soon as you have signs of impending relapse with a, a relapse re survival of 46%. Uh, what we're trying to do at the GFM once again with uh, Marie Robin is really a, not a preemptive but a uh, prophylactic approach using uh, 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 ASTX727, uh, which is a, a new uh, uh, HMA, uh, which uh, 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 and the start trial is about to start, which should be followed by DLI in patients with very high risk, which would be TB3 gene mutation and or uh, a complex monosomal carrier type. And finally, the reconforming agents, APR246. Now, this agent uh, 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 releases MQ, which is the uh, uh, um, a biological uh, uh, effective drug, and which covalently binds P53 and reconforms it and help it uh, gain its new activity, in particular, trigger cell cycle arrest and apoptosis. So the, uh, uh, the um, uh, MDS, US MDS consortium, led for this trial by, by David Salman, uh, uh, conducted a phase 1B, then a phase 2 uh, 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 trial of APR, uh, followed by azacitidine, uh, uh, 12 patients first, and 39 patients, so it's now about 50 patients now. Patients basically receive four days of APR246 and followed by classical azacitidine cycles. So those are the results in the 21st patients. Uh, CRs are in green, and the response rate was 95% was, uh, after three or six cycles, with a CR rate of 70%, which is more than you would expect with uh, azacitidine alone uh, in, uh, as a historical control. Now, David just showed me uh, a few hours ago the, uh, an update with now about 50 patients, and the response rate holds at about 85% and about 60% CR rate. It's too early to, to evaluate the response duration, but it seems longer than with uh, uh, azacitidine alone, where we know that responses are very short. So, of course, we need more follow-up um, uh, uh, for that study. And uh, interestingly, there is a, 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 an important decrease in the VEF in, in the majority of patients, and this, in those who were NGS negative, the, the, the uh, assessment of MRD was, was generally positive. This is a, a logarithmic scale, so it does not appear to be important, but it, it's, it's important in, in, in most patients tested. And the safety is, is okay, no myelosuppression, some, some neurological effects in, in some patients, which, uh, uh, especially elderly, elderly ones, which require a dose reduction. We have now, uh, we are now conducting the same trial in France, first 20 patients, so it's included so, so fast that we had to open uh, four centers and we, with a total of 51, and we have now about 40 patients included, and almost none of them had reached uh, six cycles, which shows the enthusiasm uh, for this, for this uh, tr drug following the presentation of results by, by David uh, at EHA and, and ASH. But of course, we need clearly more follow-up. Uh, the originality of, of our approach is that APR plus ASA will continue uh, after transplant in those who can be transplanted. And uh, uh, now a, a phase three trial comparing azacitidine with or without APR246 uh, is, is ongoing in, in the US and also including very fast. So, of course, we, we have to wait for longer term results, but it, well, it seems to be promising in, in this subtype of MDS, which is probably the worst. And so my conclusion is that yes, it's not transplant or other approaches. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, approaches to reduce the, 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 the tumor burden, transplant, and then even something after, which could be APR again, or, or which could be HMA plus DLI, etc. So we, we have to do a combination of, of treatments in those patients, I think. And this is the GFM, uh, which I like to acknowledge uh, for its work. Thank you.
Thank you, Pierre. Now, now is your time, Eva. Let's, let's see your point of view. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we do agree quite a lot here, but, but not totally, and I will try to, to elucidate these differences. Okay. So now we're talking about P53 mutated disease, which is a horrible disease, and I do agree that it doesn't matter if the patient had 2% blast or or 19% blast or, or 25, it's still a very bad disease, irrespective of the blast count. So I would like, I, I have a few slides, but I would like to start with, with this slide and I say, I do agree that if we have TP53 mutated MDS, which is always a high risk disease, we need to have a total concept that we have to make up our minds the first day when we sit with the patient after the full workup. You can't sort of wait and see. You have to be extremely decisive up front with the patient. And we do require pre-stem cell transplantation response to treatment because we know that if we put forward a patient to transplant with a variant allele frequency of P5389, that patient will never survive. On the other hand, we now know from today's talk by, by Eli Papamanuel and, and from that big consortium that there are patients with P53 mutations that we actually can cure. Are you because they, are, they still have one remaining healthy allele or because they don't have complex karyotype? And we have to learn much more of, of, of these patients. And they're not necessarily having big variant allele frequency. It could be small clones that are homozygous, and it could be big clones or heterozygous. So I think today's talk and the, I mean the next months will actually force us to learn more about P53 and both see the difficulties and but also the possibilities. So this is important. I think this is a pending issue. Um, this study, I think, really says that you can do something. You can't do anything in the long run. You can't cure patients by applying the increased decitabine dose, the 10 milligram, uh, the, the 10 days schedule of decytabine. But these are the data by, by Welch and the Wash U group in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago. And I would like you to just look at it. This is a complicated slide, but look at this. This is the reduction of variant allele frequency of the TP53 mutations that you achieve post decytabine treatment. And here you have the variant, vari varying mutations, and you can see here that the clone that decreased most is the P53 mutations. Another important message of this is actually this, survival according to stem cell transplantation. If you don't transplant, patients will die for sure. There is no one actually surviving. But if you do transplant, the outcome is still not perfect, but you will save some patients. And, and you have to start somewhere. And then we can ask ourselves the question that we discussed earlier today, does it matter how much you have reduced the clone? If you really would, because what I think also that we have sometimes a gap between the hematology treatment and the transplant treatment, at least in many centers. And I think it actually matters if you transplant the patient like here, when you have the maximum reduction of the clone, then if you would sort of proceed a couple of more months and let the clone grow back again, because we know that the P53 clones grow back. So timing, thinking, planning, I think, is utterly important. Then going back to the lower risk MDS, and then I will actually refrain to talk about, uh, to really talk about del 5 q because I don't think we know a lot about lower risk MDS without del 5 q and P53 mutations. This, I think, we have to wait for the big new data. But these data, you know, having a P53 mutation in low-risk DEL5Q MDS, the data that Martin Jedestin produced many years ago now in 2011, really uh, <coughs> deteriorates the prognosis, even if are, the clones are super small, like uh, down to 1%. And 18% of patients at diagnosis actually have such a clone. I think that data has been corroborated by other findings. And this is then the official randomized lenalidomide 004 trial that was published with Pierre 
as first author myself, as last author. And this is the outcome of the lenalidomide patients. And then you can see here, all these patients are not that diagnosis. They are actually EPO refractory. So they have been through with treatment. Some of them have many years here as, as uh, not very severe Del5Q. But once you become transfusion dependent, and if you don't respond to lenalidomide, here we agree that you should transplant these patients uh, because the median survival is about two years. But if you do respond to lenalidomide, this is the curve that I would like to discuss. I don't have the certain answer, but this is at least how we see it in the Nordic group. So if you do respond to lenalidomide, you have a median survival of four years. And then I think it really matters how old you are and if you are a marathon runner, what kind of expectations you have on your life. Because four years is four years, but it's not super much, I think. Also, uh, if we look at the progression rate towards AML, you can see here, this is then done by immunohistochemistry in the same 004 trial. Not all patients, only those that have had um, biopsies taken. So a third of the patients actually carry P53 mutations and they will progress towards acute leukemia within five to six years. We have a 50% progression rate. And that is also a lot. Here is uh, data from our own study. Some of them were in that study. Uh, some were not treated. And, and just to make you here, when we actually published this a couple of years ago, we had progression. This is the LEN cohort. This is the untreated cohort. Some of these were transplanted here. One progressed uh, uh, early on. But of these patients now that I just looked up a couple of years later, another four have progressed. So my impression is that if you wait five, six years on many patients, not all with LEN, you, have, you see stable increase of progression. And another important thing, this is again the uh, uh, four trial, if you do progress to leukemia, then you have a very, very poor survival. And compared to the lady with the three mutations that I showed before, I think that these patients, you don't really have time to react. If a Del5Q, P53 small clone progress to an AML, that can go within a month. And that, uh, within a month, the patient can have a complex karyotype and black from P53 staining. So here I think that actually you have to think. How, can, can you w watch and wait in patients? So actually what we are more and more doing in younger patients, in clearly transplantable fit patients, so if they don't respond to EPO, we actually evaluate if transplantation would be an option to this patient, again sitting with the individual patient. And, of course, if we do apply lenalidomide in the transplant-prone patients, we, we do very frequent NGS targeting of these patients. So here we, we had a little bit of a disagreement. And that was my slides, and now I'm happy to discuss together with Pierre. Should we come up and sit?